Hello, welcome to the Hammer Museum. I'm Claudia Bester, I'm the Director of Public Programs. I'm pleased to introduce tonight's Hammer Forum on third party elections with two presidential candidates, Buddy Romer and Rocky Anderson, as well as Kellen Arno of AmericansElect.org and moderated by Ian Masters. Um, tonight, our moderator is Ian Masters. He's gonna introduce our guest speakers. Ian is a BBC trained broadcast journalist who's covered national security affairs for over 25 years on public radio. He's the host of Background Briefing on Sundays at 11 a.m. and the Daily Briefing Mondays through Thursdays at 5 p.m., both on KPFK 90.7 FM. Ian was a senior fellow at UCLA's Center for Strategic and International Affairs and the UCLA Center for International Relations and was a consultant to the Center for National Security Studies at Los Alamos Laboratory in New Mexico. So please join me in welcoming Ian Masters. Thank you, Claudia and all of you for coming tonight to participate in a democratic experience that sadly the rest of the country is not having in this election year. By that I mean, to make a gastronomic analogy, we have a broader menu tonight than the voters have in November. More choices to whet the political appetite, a richer course of ideas and ideologies, and it's all on the house since we are not beholden to special interests, 501c4s, and super PACs. But when it comes to election night, we'll all be eating corporate food at McDonald's. And the meal won't be a happy one. And we won't be loving it. <laughs> it is a paradox that in a land that celebrates freedom, competition, diversity, and individual choice, that our politics are so frozen. Indeed, there is less turnover in the United States Congress than there was in the rubber stamp Supreme Soviet of the late USSR. With the Tweedledum and Tweedledee duopoly thoroughly entrenched, we are locked in the paradigm of the lesser of two evils or the evil of the two lessers. And as the joke goes, we need a third party because then there'll be two. <laughs> By fair means or foul, the two parties continue to dominate ballot access, media attention, and our elections. <clears throat> but now, thanks to the Supreme Court, these narrow predestined choices are themselves circumscribed by money. So getting into the race, and the race itself, is not only rigged, but getting to the finish line is almost entirely about how much money a candidate can raise. And this year we are talking about a billion raised by Obama and about the same for Romney, not to mention the billions in super PAC money sloshing around. With less than 1% of the 1% now determining our political future, we should not only be questioning the lack of choices we have, but asking ourselves whether we are still participating in a democracy or punching our ticket for a plutocracy. The beneficiaries of most of this money, by the way, are the media monopolies. They are the gatekeepers of political messages, and although they are licensed to use the public airwaves, they no longer have an obligation to inform and educate as they get rich off our broken politics with more money chasing airtime than they can sell. And since network and cable news is driven by ratings, what little substance that might emerge from our game show democracy is overwhelmed by coverage of scandal, slip-ups, personality, and process. Tonight we have two brave souls running for President of the United States the old-fashioned way. They have platforms, principles, and passion, not consultants, pollsters, spin doctors, surrogates, and stylists. We also have a representative of a new online presidential nominating process aimed at providing a competitive nonpartisan ticket, AmericansElect.org. Rather than stump speeches from our candidates, tonight we are going to learn about democracy and how it can be rescued, renewed, and refreshed. Not so much as Jefferson invoked that the tree of liberty needs to be refreshed from time to time by the blood of patriots and tyrants, but how we as citizens can re-engage our corrupt and usurped political system to reinvent a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Rocky Anderson will speak first, followed by Kellen Arno of Americans Elect, then Governor Buddy Roma. Then we four will have a discussion followed by extensive Q&A with you, our audience of voters. Rocky Anderson was the mayor of Salt Lake City from 2000 to 2008, 
During his time in office, he became known as a progressive voice in Utah politics and internationally renowned for his Salt Lake City Green Program, which drastically reduced the carbon footprint of the city's municipal operations. He currently serves as president of the Utah-based nonprofit organization High Road for Human Rights and is now running for president of the United States on the newly formed Justice, to Justice Party ticket. Welcome to back... <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Rocky Anderson. Thank you very much. Freedom, equal opportunity, compassion, security. Those are core values upon which our nation was founded and which we as Americans have had in common. Yet those values have been severely undermined by Republicans and Democrats alike during the Bush and Obama years. They can be restored, but only if we break loose of the stranglehold of the two dominant duopolis parties, the stranglehold that they have on our body politic. In the past, our nation has failed on occasion to live up to its promise, but we as a people have aspired to regain the moral high ground. And we can do it again. It is by holding true to our principles and becoming engaged that we assert our roles as citizens and as moral actors. Believing in something and acting on it is what gives our lives meaning and enriches our days on this earth. We were embroiled in the Vietnam War, but millions of empowered Americans took to the streets and wouldn't let up until the war was ended. In the 1970s, presidential and congressional committees thoroughly investigated serious abuses by the FBI and the CIA during the Cold War, and they publicly disclosed their findings. That was truly a great moment for our constitutional system of government. Among our elected officials, there were true statesmen and stateswomen, people who recognized the wisdom of Justice Brandeis's observation that the best disinfectant is sunlight. Yes, our nation has faltered, but we always sought the high road. We aspired to be and to do better. Now, things are very different. With the entrenched corporatist and militarist Democratic and Republican parties. There is no call among our elected officials for investigations, for disclosures, for accountability, or for making things fundamentally better. Instead, our president said with regard to war crimes and illegal surveillance that there will be no accountability. And he turns a blind eye to the criminality of the Wall Street bankers who contributed to his campaign. The rule of law has been decimated when it comes to holding wealthy and powerful people accountable for their criminality. That is tyranny. One person deciding whether or not the laws will be applied and to whom. Timid, cowardly elected officials political prostitutes are now running the show. They don't have the courage and integrity to discern and expose the truth, then take measures to make certain that similar abuses are never again perpetrated in our name. Perhaps that is why the majority of poll respondents want a third party or independent alternative. Perhaps that is why people are leaving both dominant parties in droves. Perhaps that is why President Obama's previously enthusiastic base is disillusioned. And perhaps that is why the approval rating for Congress hit an historic low of 8%. These elected officials and their political parties maintain the insane war on drugs and impose minimum mandatory sentences contributing to the world's highest rate of incarceration with clear racist implications. 
They drive up our debt to historic levels, mortgaging the futures of our children and later generations, while they give massive tax breaks to the wealthy. They avoid their responsibility to reform our immigration laws, and many discriminate against people on account of their sexual orientation, an issue with respect to which President Obama has demonstrated that for him, like Mitt Romney's Etch-a-Sketch, politics trumps even the most fundamental principles. For four decades, beginning with the Franklin Roosevelt administration, the wealthy paid their fair share of taxes, the middle class was thriving, and our economy was generally prosperous. Compare what is happening today with control by the duopoly of the transformed Democratic and Republican parties. Our government is bought and paid for. The U.S. health care and insurance system is a tragic, expensive, unjust aberration among developed nations because of the corrupting influence of money from the medical, for-profit insurance, and pharmaceutical industries, and the failure of Republicans and Democrats to end the obscene plutocracy. Because of the astounding influence over our government from the fossil fuel industries, Democrats and Republicans alike have failed to provide essential international leadership in combating climate chaos. And the stranglehold the military-industrial complex has on our government because of the pork barrel politics of Democrats and Republicans who have sold our nation and its people down the river simply so they can brag during their campaigns about all the federal money they bring to their states and to their districts. They see that as good politics. I see it as treason. We can eliminate the corruption that has transformed our government. We can clean up our campaign system with public financing of campaigns and free and equal access to the public's airwaves. We can eliminate the perverse notion that corporations are people under the Constitution. We can reverse the Citizens United case and stop the obscene purchase of elections by unrestrained corporations. But to achieve that, we need to pursue a route other than continued blind loyalty to the Democratic or Republican parties. As working men and women and their families struggle every day just to get by, Congress and the President refuse to demand a renegotiation of trade agreements to bring back jobs lost to other nations. We need fair trade, not simply free trade. Likewise, the two dominant parties have refused to implement proven initiatives like the WPA to put millions of people to work in repairing our rapidly deteriorating infrastructure. Notwithstanding the corrupt relationship between the two dominant parties and the financial industry, we must break up any banks considered too big to fail. And we should restore the Glass-Steagall Act, which prohibited the common ownership of investment banks, commercial banks, and insurance companies. If we really want change, we must elect people to office who are committed to changing the rules so they serve the interests of the American people rather than solely the corporate elite and the two political parties they have purchased. Our republic is being transformed into a tyranny with an imperial presidency unlike anything known before in US history. Many of us thought the Bush years were simply an aberration, but in many respects, it is now worse. Wars are being waged without the constitutionally essential authorization of Congress. U.S. citizens have been assassinated by order of President Obama without any semblance of due process. And Congress and President Obama, in perhaps the most subversive and anti-American act ever, have authorized the kidnapping and indefinite detention for up to one's life without charges, without trial, without legal assistance, and without the right of habeas corpus. 
Together, we can stop the betrayal of the people of this nation, the betrayal of the American dream, and the betrayal of the values that have made our nation and our people what we were before the transformation toward totalitarianism and plutocracy by the two corporatist and militarist dominant parties. Now is the time to break free. Now is the time to insist upon an end to the greatest economic disparity since the 1920s in income and wealth between the small elitist class of the US financial aristocracy and the rest of us. Now is the time to demand that our republic be restored. It can be done if we will together stand up against the Republican and Democratic parties and for economic, social, and environmental justice. It can be done if we stand up tenaciously and courageously for the values of freedom, equal opportunity, compassion, and security. It can be done if we organize together for the restoration of the American dream and the values that provided a guiding light along the extraordinary American journey. Thank you. Kellen Arno is National Field Director for AmericansElect.org. He has in, been involved in political campaigns and electoral projects for more than five years. Kellen worked on dozens of statewide initiative campaigns, including projects for Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, Governor Jeb Bush, and the California Chamber of Commerce. Kellen spent two years in the executive office of the California Secretary of State's office as media relations specialist. Following that, he worked on the California gubernatorial campaign for Secretary of State Bill Jones. Recently, Kellen worked on several international, presidential, and parliamentary campaigns, providing general consulting and GoTV advice to several candidates. Ladies and gentlemen, Kellen Arno. First of all, thank you very much to the Hammer Forum for having me. So I'm here with Americans Elect, which really is founded on a pretty simple idea, which is that if we can change the way we elect our leaders, then we can change the way they govern. And we're going to do that by hosting the first ever direct online nominating convention that's going to put a unity ticket on the ballot in all 50 states to compete against Republicans and Democrats. It's an entirely new way of selecting our presidential candidates. Before I go into a little bit how this process is going to work, I thought it'd be nice to touch a little bit on, on why we think this is the right time for this kind of innovation. A lot of it's been touched on by both Ian and, and Mary Anderson, so I'll try to, to, to go through it as quickly as possible uh, to not be too, too depressing here. Um, but uh, we'll go ahead and get started on that. So for the most part, the last couple of years, we've spent a lot of time talking to people across the country. And what we've found is really backed up a lot of the polling, which is just a general trend and dissatisfaction with the way this country's headed. For a lot of the reasons we've just heard discussed, we've watched this happen. For the most part, the public has just seen no progress on the major issues that are facing us today. Now, whether that's income inequality, or whether it's un un a rising unemployment statistics, whether it's the, the continual ballooning of our federal deficit, or even health care, all this is adding up to the fact that for the first time in nearly 30 years, a majority of Americans actually believe that today, it's not likely that, to, I'm sorry, that today's youth will actually have a better life than the previous generation. I think this is a very, very damaging statistic. And for me, it's something that I think is really a fundamental part of the American dream is leaving a better generation for a younger one. So that's a very alarming statistic. And one of the things we found from talking to people is a lot of this is a function of this crisis of governments we're having. And we're seeing that related down in the polls, whether it's just general dissatisfaction with the way folks feel our country is being governed, or more specific to the congressional and Senate levels, we're seeing this trend where people are more and more frustrated and fed up. In fact, we had an opportunity to go around the country and talk to folks and, and listen to what they had to say about politics in Washington. I wanted to share a little bit of what they had to say with you guys here tonight. We're in a mess. It's sort of messed up. It's really a mess. I think it's already been a mess, and I think it still kind of is a mess. It's kind of gotten messier and messier. And everybody's arguing, and nobody can agree on anything. There's this war going on between people based on their parties versus what is actually right. It's bitter and it's crazy. Nobody can get along. It's stupid. It's absolutely stupid. Isn't it crazy that these two sides can't figure things out and how they should work? I, I, it's beyond my realm of comprehension. They're acting like children. We're adults. Can't we work together? But they can't work together. 
So that's what drives me nuts. I just feel like they're not looking out for us. It's like peacocking almost, where everyone's just trying to fluff their feathers and like look pretty for the camera so they can vote, get voted in next term. People aren't interested in doing what's best for the country, they're just interested in saving their jobs in 2012. Everybody's getting upset over this. I'm very, very disappointed in our system. We're mad as hell. I'm frustrated with both parties, both houses. It just, it just, it fries my, my cakes. I mean, I just don't, don't care for it. I see a lot of posturing. I see a lot of egos, but I don't see a lot of humility. If I acted this way in my company, I'd be fired. So I think all of this pretty much adds up to right now, we've seen statistics here that actually seven, only 17% rather of likely US voters believe the federal government today has a consent of the governed. This is a, a very uh, sad thing and I think that there's a lot of reasons behind it but at Americans Elect one of the things we feel and I think we heard a little bit of it in the discussion about the duopoly earlier is this polarization that we've seen. And this polarization is, is well documented. And in fact, you know, this is a quick graphic here just sort of showing the, the lack of overlap between the most conservative and most liberals uh, members of the US Senate, whereas there used to be quite a lot of overlap between them. Now it's completely stratified. Both are on, on the, the far right and far left of their party. And a lot of this is blamed on money, and, and that's certainly rightfully so. We've certainly seen issues with, with uh, gerrymandering. That's an actual congressional district from the state of Illinois. Where, where candidates are actually more concerned about an attack from the far right or far left than they are from being challenged by the other party. So they have to go to the far right or far left to stay in office. And lastly, as it relates to the presidential process, we've seen a, a situation where a handful of states and therefore a handful of people have a lot more sway than, than a huge portion of, of the rest of the population. Here in California, obviously, we won't have a say this year in, de in de deciding who we want our candidates to be. So naturally, voters, as we heard earlier, are leaving both of these parties. It's kind of hard to imagine why. But we are seeing record levels of people leaving both parties and, and also increasingly high levels of folks registering as independent voters. Here's a, a quick graphic of just some of the eight battleground states. And you can just see there's a tremendous amount of movement, which I think highlights 2012 to be a very interesting race. One of the things beyond voter registration, too, is for the first time in a long while, folks are actually self-identifying themselves as independents at a higher rate than they are either Democrat or Republican. And again, this is, I think, a, a really growing trend towards a, a very interesting 2012 election. None of this should really surprise us. This has been around for a long time. As you can see here, here's George Washington and James Madison, the Federalist Papers, warning us against the, the political factions and the damage it can do. Unfortunately, it looks at, like they've uh, been proven correct in this instance. And what's becoming really clear is that voters do want this other choice. They're tired of always voting in the negative. And I think right now, for the first time, we're seeing that there's actually a percentage, a first time in a while, rather, a percentage of folks who are very much in favor of either a third party or an independent candidate facing off against Republicans and Democrats. This ABC News Washington Post poll from late last year shows that 61% of folks polled were in favor of an independent candidate running against Republicans and Democrats. So this is where Americans elect felt there was an opportunity to come in and find a solution. And what we're trying to do is to take our newest innovations in technology and apply them to our democracy. And how it works is pretty simple. Any registered voter in the country can come to our website and sign up to be a delegate at our, at our online convention. When you come to sign up, you'll be asked or taken through a series of questions that'll help kind of guide you along and determine a political profile for yourself. From there, you'll actually be able to be matched up with our various candidates. We actually have two types of candidates. We have candidates who've declared, uh, like Governor Romer here. We also have candidates who, are draft, who can be drafted. So any registered voter, once again, can start a draft committee. You'll be able to link up and be matched with candidates who match your profile or match your questions to your answer. And you'll also be able to, to go through and find candidates yourself. You'll also have a unique opportunity to really be a part of shaping the platform of questions. And this is a mechanism that all of our candidates are going to have to answer. And it's going to help in terms of, of letting our voters decide who's going to be to best represent the Americans elect ticket. So starting actually next month is the first round of our qualifying ballots where the, the, all of our candidates will be up uh, to be voted on. And the winner of these qualifying rounds will actually then be asked to choose a running mate. And he, he or she will have to be, to choose a running mate, rather, who's not from their own political party. So we're forcing our candidate to reach across the aisle and form a unity ticket, because we think that that's a solution to the polarization, and we can start solving some of these problems that we've seen today. So just a brief update on where we are today. Obviously, one of the biggest, biggest barriers for us is to make sure that this ticket's on the ballot in all 50 states. 
So I'm happy to say we are uh, about 85% of the way done there. We've collected 2.5 million signatures to date. We're actually certified on the ballot in only 25 states. We're waiting. There's uh, quite a process, as you can imagine, for them to certify the signatures. But we're very confident that when uh, November 2012 rolls abound, we'll be on all 50 states. Our website has had 3 million visitors with over 19 million questions answered. So people are really getting in and getting active with the website. And to date, we have a little over 400,000 delegates who signed up to participate. We've been covered in a lot of, uh, a lot of media, which is, I think is helpful to, to shine a light on what it is we're trying to do and, and really reimagine this process. We've raised $35 million, which is funding our website, which is uh, an incredible expense because of the, the high level of security we need to make sure that it's secure and safe for folks to participate, and the ballot access effort, which is a tremendous obstacle that uh, this duopoly that we've discussed really does an excellent job of maintaining, and we're doing our best to, to, to take that down. We also have assembled a board of uh, an advisory board of very, very diverse backgrounds in terms of political ideologies and, and professional experience. And lastly, we've got a, a, a very powerful community leadership out there. We have over 3,000 plus active volunteers who are helping us get the word out. And we've actually ha have a college chapter on over 250 campuses and a, a Students United program, which is actually geared towards first time voters in 2012. So this obviously begs the big question is whether or not our candidate can win. And I think more, more uh, apropos to this panel would be whether an independent candidate can win. And so I think taking a look at recent history, obviously John Anderson and Ross Pro are two probably the best examples of an independent-minded candidate. Uh, and what we learned from there is that if you can uh, overcome these obstacles, these ballot access obstacles, and, and certainly get yourself in the debates, you can be successful. I'm taking a look at Ross Perot there, a lot of people forget he was leading, actually, in the polls, 39% of the vote in June until he dropped out of the campaign. He still earned about 19% of the popular vote, uh, and, and I, interestingly enough, also took away equally from Republicans and Democrats. And one of the interesting things there is that if you take a look at this poll we looked at earlier about levels of dissatisfaction, when you take a look at 1980 and 1992, it was nowhere near the anger, the outrage that we're experiencing today. So I think, as, as, as Mary Anderson said, I think that the stage is really set for this type of candidate to really come in and make a difference. And we did a poll actually at the very end of last year where we learned that just a, a general, I'm sorry, a generic unity ticket up against the generic Democrat Republican ticket would actually get 25% of the vote. So that's with no campaigning, no name recognition. I think that really speaks to the testament of people who really would like to see change in both the process and about who governs us. And lastly, I'll leave you with this. This is uh, Curtis Gann's Five Conditions for Electoral Success. He's a political scientist who has a lot of experience running campaigns. A deep feeling that the nation is on the wrong, wrong track disaffection with the two major parties and their candidates, a line on the ballot in every state, adequate money to conduct a competitive campaign, candidates for president and vice president whom the public can feel are competent and who offer hope of something different than what has occurred. Now, we feel pretty strongly that Americans elect that these five conditions are met by us. And, and I think that what we are look forward to is really changing that process and changing the way we, we pick a president in 2012. And really it comes back to that idea that if we can change the way our leaders are elected, that we can change the way they govern, so that the public interest can become the new special interest. So, thank you. Former Louisiana Governor Charles Buddy Elson Roma III is an independent candidate running for President of the United States. Buddy served four terms as U.S. Congressman as a conservative Democrat, often breaking ranks with his party. As Congressman, he never accepted special interest money, remaining free from the special favors expected of Congressmen by their corporate campaign contributors. But he left Congress to challenge the corrupt incumbent Louisiana Governor Edwin Edwards. Through scholarship, hard work, independent thinking, and a zeal for reforming government, without the help of PAC money, the Roma Revolution successfully ousted Edwards, and he entered the governor's mansion in 1988. But he left public office in 1992 and has pursued a variety of business ventures, most recently as the founder, CEO, and president of Business First Bank, a community bank with approximately a billion dollars in assets. With a focus on small business lending, Business First Bank took no bailout money from the federal government and restructured loans after the financial crisis of 2008 instead of foreclosing on homeowners. Ladies and gentlemen, Buddy Roma. Thank you for the kind introduction. I'm, I'm pleased to be here. I'm glad you came. I apologize for my Kleenex and my cold. 
I, it was either at the University of California at Davis or the University of California at Berkeley. Sometime three days ago, I caught a cold. I don't want to blame either school, but uh, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I didn't think I'd ever run for office again. It had been 16, 20 years. I'm happy. I'm a grandfather. I'm 68. I got three kids, three grandchildren. My bank has done well. We're the most profitable bank in Louisiana. We're growing solid and steady and entering new states. I love helping people, starting small businesses. I didn't think I'd run for office again. I have no ego. I've been to the White House a hundred times. I headed a group of Democrats called the Bull Weevils, and when Reagan was president, we were there almost every day. We gave him a majority in the House. That's the way parties used to work then. They were broad enough that their wings overlapped, and in the middle is where you got work done. I'm the only guy running for president who's been a congressman and a governor. I took a state with 12.8% unemployment, corrupt, the governor used to brag about taking money. Said it wasn't illegal in Louisiana. Well, we made it illegal. He spent $20 million. I spent less than a million, and I beat him in the first primary. People will decide on clean leadership, free to lead. They will decide if you can make the case that we can come together and put our nation ahead of our party, put our grandchildren ahead of a political whoosh. I didn't think I'd run for office again, but I looked at Washington and I saw Louisiana. I saw political corruption. I saw a system that was corrupt. I saw a system where a big check was more important than a good idea. I saw a system where plain people did not count anymore. I saw a system where 99% of Americans didn't give a penny to a politician and then griped for the next four years about what they had gotten. I watched Clinton do away with Glass-Steagall. I watched Bush do away with sanity in terms of bailing out the banks. And I watched Obama with no plan at all. And I wondered if we could do better. I looked carefully at the records four years ago between Obama and McCain. They raised more money from lobbyists and PACs in Washington, D.C. than they did from the citizens of 32 states combined. You don't have any influence over who's president unless you write a big check. And it used to be in the old days, we would debate on the House floor. I tend to be conservative on economic issues. I like budgets that are in balance, and we can do this in five years without hurting people. We can do it. I can show you on paper how it can be done. You do away with the ethanol subsidies and the oil subsidies and the energy subsidies. You take 42% of federal employees are going to retire in the next 10 years, and you just replace half of them. You take the post office and downsize it so it works again. The world has changed, but Congress doesn't. It's in the re-election business. It's in the fundraising business. And they spend at least a third of their time doing that. Two particular bills got my attention down in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I'm a diabetic. I've been an insulin-dependent diabetic since I was in my teen years, for about 50 years. I'm 68. I take care of myself. I weigh 148 pounds. When I graduated from Harvard College, I weighed 151. So I stay in shape, and I pay much attention to my health. So I liked when Obama said, we'll do health care reform. I thought to myself, I know people who can't afford to be sick, and we need to do reform. So what did he do? Did he call doctors and nurses and patients and come up with a new delivery system? No. He called lobbyists and lawyers and insurance executives and pharmaceutical executives. He calls the problem in the room. 
and divided health care up. Do you know his health care bill doesn't allow pharmaceuticals to give price discounts? It's against the law. It doesn't allow fair competition from Canada. It's against the law. Do you know you can't buy health insurance across the state line? It's against the law. That's not health care reform. That's a $500 billion tax on people and doesn't solve the problem at all. You could lower the price of health care to every American if you got a system of choice and competition. Second, I watched the bank reform bill. Now, I'm a banker. I was on the banking committee with Barney Frank 30 years ago. Don't even bring it up, but there I was. And Chuck Schumer and all the usual suspects. I know banking inside and out. It's what I do. And I'm proud of the people that we've put to work at our bank. I am proud of what we do. But I looked at bank reform under this president. Too big to fail is still the law. Capital ratios didn't go up with the size of the bank. And Glass-Steagall is not to be found anywhere. It's not reform. And what did President Obama do after he signed the bill? The next week, he went to Wall Street, had a fundraiser, $35,000 a ticket, and it was sponsored by Goldman friggin' Sachs. Now look, I love America. I think our best years are ahead of us. I don't think we have a problem that we can't solve together. That's what I believe. And I decided to walk out of the small town shadows and offer myself as an example of how we could turn this nation around. But the first step is not bank reform. It's not budget reform. It's not tax reform. It's not immigration reform. It's not health care reform. It's not trade reform. All those things need to be done. The first step is campaign reform. Washington is not just broken. It's bought. And unless we take away the right of the big boys to buy our presidents, we'll go through this over and over again. You know who the two largest corporate givers were in the last four years? General Electric, which made $15.4 billion last year and paid zero in federal income tax, and Goldman Sachs, which got a $685 billion bailout and didn't pay a penny of interest on it. I love America. We have problems we can fix. I think we're headed for more trouble. But we need a president free to lead. Here's my first bill. House Bill 1, full disclosure on contributions, 48-hour reporting of contributions, not 120 days, not 365 days, 48 hours. Number three, PACs can't give anything more than individuals. Whatever the individual limit is, PACs will be the same. Number four, no lobbyist can bring a check. He can bring an idea. She can bring a thought. But she can't be part of the fundraiser. She has a choice. Raise money for the candidate or bring them an idea. You can't do both. And number five, super PACs are clearly illegal. By the Supreme Court's own definition, they said that the appearance of corruption is the enemy of democracy and that independents don't have to be regulated as long as they're independent. Well, let me tell you a story. Mitt Romney spoke to the fundraiser for his own super PACs. That's not independent. Barack Obama has four of them, and they're run by his cabinet secretaries and his ex-chief of staff. That's not independent. Super PACs are clearly illegal, and I will outlaw them. And number six, we will have criminal penalties for the politicians who violate this law right now. They just get a slap on the hand. Love America? How can I win? I need 3 million people to stand with me out of 310 million. 3 million at $100 each. We'll whip these boys, and it'll be fun doing it. Thanks. So <clears throat> let me start with the both candidates running for president. I'll start with you, Rocky. Um, how are you being denied access? Because we haven't really spoken about the press as the gatekeepers. 
there's also this presidential commission. Um, so walk us through what changes took place so that the two parties essentially decide who gets to debate. You know, it's interesting that the United States went over and met with a number of European countries and, and uh, infant Eastern European democracies. And we laid out for them what you needed to have as a democracy. And in that description is that you must allow people to form political parties and to compete on an equal basis. And yet you come back to the United States, it is absolutely anti-democratic at every stage. We have this crazy quilt system of ballot access. You heard about the millions of dollars that, that Americans elect is spending to get on the ballot. Uh, it, it is virtually impossible for Buddy Romer or Rocky Anderson, even with all the great support we have around the country, to get on the ballots in every state. It, it's an enormous task. We formed the Justice Party in mid-December. California has the absurd deadline for parties to get on the ballot of January 3rd. We would have had to have 103,000 Californians change their voter registration and register as members of the Justice Party or over a million people sign a petition by January 3rd to get on the ballot. So as a result, the people of California do not have the choice to vote for Justice Party candidates in November. Now, the other aspect of this that is absolutely as chilling in terms of our anti-democratic approach to all of this <coughs> is the League of Women Voters used to independently organize presidential debates. They did a great job of it. They set uh, up how they would be run, the format, where they'd be held, how many there would be, who else would be allowed on the stage besides the candidates from the two dominant parties. And then along comes the Presidential Debate Commission. And if you're like I used to be, you see their, their nice little insignia, it looks like an independent or a government-run commission. It's not. It was wholly formed by the Democratic and Republican parties, they hijacked the presidential debates away from the League of Women Voters, and they keep everybody else off the stage. They leave it up to the candidates and their representatives to, to negotiate and draft a memorandum of understanding. They determine how many debates there will be, what the format will be, uh, even how many seconds response there will be, and then they hand it over to the independent or the, the debate commission, not independent at all, and then they go out and execute for them. It's all absolutely contrary to the interests of the American public. When Bill Clinton was leading Bob Dole by 17%, Bob Dole said, I don't want Perot on the stage. And Clinton's folks said, okay, you get that, we decide everything else. And what did they decide? They decided there would be only 90 second responses, that there would be only two debates, and that they would be scheduled opposite the World Series playoff baseball games. What, what a disservice to the people of this country and our democracy. George Stephanopoulos even admitted when he was interviewed after the election by Chris Matthews, that the Clinton administration was intent because they were leading by such a large margin that the debates be a non-event. And that's exactly what they were and it's what they continue to be as long as they don't allow others on the stage to provide different points of view, a different voice. Can you imagine if Buddy Romer and Rocky Anderson were on the stage with Mitt Romney and Barack Obama, what a different discussion there would be? So, Buddy, you've been campaigning you were in all the primaries, and yet you weren't, you weren't in the debates. How have they kept you off the TV? They were, they were fairly direct. I would call before each of debates. There were 23 nationally televised debates. 
I was the only Republican running who had been elected congressman and governor. Uh, my poll standing was very small. I, w I had been out of politics for 20 years. So when I first called, they said, well, you have to be a formally declared candidate. You're not yet formally declared. So I did that at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire two weeks later. I called again for the next debate, and they said, well, you have to have 1% in a national poll. I worked for five weeks. I got 1%. I called again. And they said, now it's 2%, buddy. <laughs> uh, I got 2%. It took another five weeks. I mean, I had very little money. I had no stage, was not on the stage. I'm running against eight people who are there every week in a national debate. I got 2%. I called again. And they said, well, you have to have 3%. I got 3%. I called again, and they said, you have to raise a half a million dollars in the last 90 days. And I said, is that the way Republicans are going to select their nominee? Somebody who can raise a half a million dollars in 90 days from special interest. My, I've raised money more than any other candidate, more than any in terms of contributors. It's 106,000 contributors. My average, my average gift is about $20 per from every state. And they were going to hold it against me finally that I hadn't raised a half a million dollars in 90 days. I mean, I take it as a badge of honor that I left the Republican Party five weeks ago, became an independent. To me, it's not about party. I'm the only governor that changed parties when he was governor. I was elected a conservative Democrat. I looked out over my legislature. I had 144 members of the Louisiana legislature. 138 of them were Democrats. That's a one-party state. You know what a one-party state is, don't you? Corrupt. So I said, I went home that night, and I talked to my wife, and I said, I'm going to change parties. I just soon be a Republican as a Democrat. We're going to have a two-party state. I was only the second Republican governor in the history of Louisiana. That's 200 years. We've had two more since then, and we have a two-party state, and it's better. The only thing better than a two-party state is a three-party state, and we can have some choices. In terms of uh, Americans elect, this uh, use of merging digital technology and democracy. There is also this, this phenomenon called the digital divide and the extent to which, uh, well, there's a couple of statistics that are quite shameful. The United States invented the internet. It wasn't Al Gore, but the United States invented the internet. Uh, and yet they keep lagging in penetration. South Korea and others have high-speed internet. France is, even has it. It's ubiquitous, it's a utility. So we don't have a lot of penetration, and it tends to be concentrated. The more affluent you are, the more likely you are online. So how can you have a national uh, uh, election campaign based upon the Internet with so many people shut out? Sure. I mean, I think that's one of the things that we found early on as we, as we built the website was we wanted to make sure that it was accessible from a wide range of people. Um, it was a question we heard a lot was about how would we – uh, I think really get out and engage with with the electorate and make sure that the digital divide didn't become an issue. Um, and I think where we started out was from kind of a belief that this is the future of of how we will vote. This is the future of how we will engage with, with politicians. Uh, and I think that our feeling on it was we had to take the first step. Uh, and, and we didn't feel comfortable the duopoly would, I think, for the lack of a better word, sort of take that plunge and, and make it happen for fear of, of losing, I guess, market share would be the only way to, to think of it. Uh, but as we sort of started to build out and, and uh, first kind of find, I guess, what you'd call an early adopter, uh, find folks that came to the website, one of the things we really did in terms of building up a community leadership was impress upon them the importance for them to get out into their communities and really speak to people and drive traffic to the website. Uh, and, and what we did is we kind of created a series of of informal meetups. We actually had a partnership through meetup.com and what we encouraged folks to do was have folks over and set up the website and walk folks through it that weren't particularly, uh, I guess, familiar with the internet or familiar with the American Select website. It's not to say that we'd reach everybody or that we ever felt we'd reach everybody, but I think what we wanted to make sure we did was we made it as secure as possible, as accessible as possible, and I think in comparison to the current system, which is voting voting, uh, voting booths, we wanted to make sure there was a technology that anybody could go to their local library and participate. I think that's the, the sort of the same level of, of action that we see currently, and again, we're taking helping, I think, take that first step towards the future of, of voting. Well, let me, if I could say something, add to that. Uh, 
the Americans elect's strength is that it's on all 50 ballots when they get through with their work. And so there will only be three candidates that will actually probably have that opportunity. Second, I don't take any money from them. They, they, don't, they don't affect the rules that I've set, the, the Romer rules, no PAC money, no super PAC money, everything fully disclosed, 48-hour reporting, the things that we try to do. But what they're good at is ballot access. I see how difficult it's been. I've never run for president before. It's been quite an education. When I started out in December of 2010, I was six foot one. I had light brown hair, <laughs> and I used to smile a lot. But, but after fooling with these party primaries, do you know, you know how you get on the ballot in South Carolina in the Republican Party? I don't know about the Democratic Party. $35,000. That's what they charge you to be on the ballot in South Carolina. I mean, it is outrageous how each state sets up its own rules, and they're not designed to include. They're designed to limit. Is it any wonder out of 312 million Americans, we're going to be able to choose one of two people, Mr. 1%, Mitt Romney, or President Obama? That's our only choice. Let's do better than that, America. It doesn't have to be me. Take somebody better than me. But I want somebody on fire and who's fighting for plain people. I'm a Teddy Roosevelt guy. Here's what he said. He asked the Republican Party, are we going to be the party of Wall Street in privilege? Or are we going to be the party of plain people who fight the wars, build the roads, and build a great nation? That's what I want to be part of. So, spoken like a real bull moose. That's right. <laughs> well, a small bull moose. <laughs> <laughs> so, Rocky, is there any way, uh, we, you know, again, I get back to the media because they are the gatekeepers, and, and it, obviously ballot access is the first step, and the American selector found a way around it. Ross Perot had the sufficient money to be able to get on the ballots. Uh, it's a tough road. But then, then is then the next one is how do you get noticed, you know, and who and how do you get anybody to r report on you? And if you can't, if they won't let you on on the debates, uh, how do you make news? Um, is there are there any alternatives to to guerrilla ways to get through, you know, alternative media, the internet, to get your message out? This is a vital issue, obviously, in our democracy, because if, if the voters aren't aware, if we're not able to reach them, then they really don't have a choice. Um, I think that if, if somebody qualifies, and by the way, uh, Buddy Romer and I are both declared candidates on Americans Elect, but there are two very different criteria that are applied to us qualifying to even get in the first round of voting, and neither one of us are qualified yet. Uh, for Buddy Romer, he needs a 1,000 supporters in 10 different states. I need 5,000 supporters in 10 different states, and I'm running second, and I got into it later than Buddy. We're running first and second on Americans Elect, but running second among declared candidates I am very likely not even going to be in the first round of voting given the rules of Americans elect. I think that's real unfortunate when they're trying to provide a more democratic approach. Well, let's have their spokesperson. But, oh. it, but I think the candidate with Americans elect is going to get a lot of attention from the media. And what I'm saying is that once I got into this race, we were getting a lot of good media coverage, a lot of national television. And I think it's because they realize that there is a perfect storm brewing in this country. You saw the poll results. Over 54% of Americans wanting a third party or an independent candidate alternative. An 8% approval rating of Congress. People leaving the Democratic and Republican parties. And they know that their audience wants to hear a different voice, and we can provide that. But the other thing that's so remarkable now that we've never had in our nation's history is the democratized means of communication through social media. And I draw real inspiration from the Arab uprisings, 
because we saw people coming together, organizing at the grassroots, utilizing social media, and they were able in Tunisia, in Libya, in Egypt, to overthrow their dictators. We can do the same thing if we'll rise up, if we'll organize at the grassroots, utilizing the democratized means that we have available to us now, and we can overthrow the dictatorship of corrupt money in our electoral system. It, answer Rocky's question about the rules. Here you are setting up an alternative to the, to the frozen Jurassic system we have, and now you got him tied up in rules. No, I mean, absolutely. I think one of the things that we found from the beginning was that uh, anytime you're going to innovate a system and, and create new technology, it's important to strike up a balance between making sure that the, the process is credible, but also trying to bring in as many participants as possible. And, and we certainly tried to strike that balance. And, and uh, we did it with, with both folks that had experience in terms of, of building organizations, but also we did it with input from, from our, our, our volunteers and our delegates as well. And uh, I think one of the things we wanted to avoid from the outset was, and a lot of folks in this room might recall the, the recall election where we had hundreds of of uh, candidates, um, some of whom were far more qualified than others. I think we wanted to really strike that balance where we had some level of, of uh, I guess, uh, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Some level of, of uh, proving that, I guess, you're, you're capable of maintaining or at least performing the job. And I, I don't know if what we found was the perfect balance, but I think what we're finding now is that uh, we're really getting involved in terms of making sure the word's out to our delegates to, to get on the website and support the various candidates. Uh, I would love to see, see both of these gentlemen on the, nominating, on the nominating rounds, um, and because I, I think one of the fundamental things about Americans Elect is more choice is better, and so we certainly don't want to see that limited. I think we're just trying to, to keep that balance to make sure that's, that's safe and secure at this point. Well, let's have just one last question here because mm -hmm. I want to uh, bring the audience in and I'm sure they're itching to talk to you gentlemen. Um, I did a, we did a ham, hammer forum here a few months ago with two political pros, a Democrat and a Republican, um, um, and uh, one had run McCain's campaign and the other one had run a bunch of Democratic campaigns for president. And the depressing thing that they told us was that most of the money that's raised, you know, you sell your soul to raise money, which you then turn over to the media monopolies, and then that money is spent only on the swing states, you know, the eight swing states. So the rest of the country doesn't even know there's an election, by and large, whereas the eight swing states are inundated. And then when it gets down to uh, October, they then target the people, the undecided and if you're undecided in October, you tend to be kind of brain dead. You know, you're not, you don't have watch TV, you don't read newspapers. Why are and, you looking at me? <laughs> well, I, <laughs> the, the, the question is addressed, <laughs> the long and the short of it is, that at the end of the day, this little sliver of 3 to 6% of, you know, couch potatoes who don't read newspapers decide our elections. It's, it's a rigged system. This is, we don't choose our candidates in an open primary. It's closed, and the rules are written by the parties, and the rules are different state to state, party to party. It's convoluted. It's complicated. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't have a candidacy at all at 5% in a national poll without social media. I mean, my, my little team of volunteers is the best. I mean, we tweet everything and everybody. I, I know I've tweeted with at least 40 of you in the audience tonight. I mean, while we weren't on any debate, we tweeted throughout every debate. We answered the questions. Every question asked, we did it real time and live. In fact, I answered for Rick Perry when he forgot one of the answers. <laughs> I mean, it's not that I'm that smart. I just heard him enough times. I mean, you know. But, but look, this is interesting and exciting, and it's valuable. If Rocky can break through or I can break through or Americans elect can break through and we could get on the debate stage with Obama, Romney and Romer. That's my dream at night, you know, Obama, Romney and Romer. Now, those two guys went to Harvard, but it was Harvard Law School. I'm undergraduate in the business school. I will eat their lunch, folks. Give me a chance. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. They're smart guys, but Lord have mercy. 
So let's have questions, and we have microphones on both sides. And uh, and the contenta has a thousand. So would you please address that? Sure. It's Kellen, actually. Uh, I'm filling in for Elliot tonight. Um, yeah, I, certainly. I mean, one, it's been a, an area of, of great questioning for us. And, and what we kind of decided early on was that we created this sort of two-tiered system uh, of folks that had what was considered to be uh, at least professional experience related to, or that I think would sort of prove out that they'd had the experience capable of serving as, as president. And then folks who, who hadn't at least had that, that, uh, that experience. I didn't draw the line in terms of deciding who, uh, who fit the bill and who didn't. Um, I think that the, the designation for a mayor is that if you've been a mayor of a city in the top 100 uh, in terms of population, that you would fall in, in Buddy, in, in Governor Romer's category, anything higher you'd fall in the, in the general approach. Um, I think the idea behind it, again, was to strike that balance and to sort of say that if you're somebody that didn't have kind of a traditional track record uh, that would enable you to, to walk into Washington and, and create the solutions, then it was important for you to, to prove the ability to, to gather support amongst the American, uh, the Americans elect delegates. And so that was the idea behind it. Uh, I mean, that, that was the, the certainly, again, that balance trying to find of sort of saying we want to have as much choice as possible, but we also want to make sure we have a, a credible process with folks who are, who are prepared and able to, to, uh, to serve. And the difficulty of that is that a 1,000 in 10 states is hard to get. Yeah. Now, much less Rocky having to get 5,000. That's almost impossible, Rock. I don't see how you're going to do it. It's not and I'll tell you, 1,000, I haven't done that yet. And we've worked at it for this is our fourth week. That, that we've been active it with volunteers and field work. Because of security, uh, it's hard to get in to get a vote. So uh, uh, I, I don't have an easy answer for it. I didn't write the rules. I read them, and I didn't, I didn't know there was a difference between candidates. I thought everybody had 1,000, which would be fine with me. But I think we need more, not less. And let me just say this. I have had infinitely more management and executive experience than the man who's in the White House today before he got there. I was over a, more than a $200 million general fund budget, as well as a major RDA budget, and over a major international airport. I served two terms. Salt Lake City is the 125th largest city in the country. So because we're not within the top 100, now the burden is five times more. And it seems to me Americans elect ought to go with the people and who they're supporting rather than these arbitrary rules that were set in the beginning. Well, I guess you're going to be reporting back to some people, right? Yeah, and to be, to be fair, too, this is not something that, this is certainly not the first time we've heard this. And one of the great things we've really tried to do, I think, is to, to have a lot of feedback from folks. And, and um, I, I would not sit on the stage tonight and say that we've, we've created the perfect system. I, what I would say is that we're really trying to take, uh, create a process that I think is ultimately more inclusive and also takes that step towards injecting a little bit more technology and a little bit more, I think, broad-based participation that I think we could really see uh, in both parties. I mean, as a registered voter in California, again, it's, it's frustrating to not even get to participate or, or vote sure. in terms of having a choice. Um, in terms of developing the rules, I mean, I think you know we had the, this idea that we needed to have three successful things. We needed to have the 50-state ballot access. We needed to have a credible process, which included both the website and the rules, and that was in order to be taken seriously, not just by our delegates, but also by, by candidates. And that third thing would be the, 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 the making sure we have a credible candidate to offer the American people. Um, and so I think that the rules were certainly well-intentioned in terms of supporting that second foundation of a, of a credible process. And again, I wasn't, I wasn't part of it, so I'm not sure how the line was drawn or, or what, was, what was designated. Um, and it's, it's hard because I think that uh, I, I hear some, some folks that have criticism of that, and I think the way it's panned out, that's certainly fair. On the other hand, um, you know, if we didn't have anything like that, there's also the potential, and obviously these rules were written, written quite, quite long ago, uh, that we had a lot of people. I, it was the, the sort of the Lady Gaga argument that we heard very early on it was great. It's going to be a popularity contest, which means Lady Gaga is going to be the candidate. I think the idea was if you had a higher bar for her, and that's sort of the will of the people, so to speak, then that's fair, but it was important to, to make sure that she was really proving out that she could gather that support to be there. So that was the idea behind it. Um, and, and with that said, you know, the underlying foundation is more choice is better. So, yes, I'll be reporting back. That's fair. Well, in, in the spirit of, of open debate, uh, 
a, a criticism, and I hope it's constructive, of Americans elect uh, goes a lot deeper than the somewhat arbitrary barriers to qualify, although I'm critical of that. A greater criticism on my part is the lack of disclosure of the funders of, of Americans elect. Now, uh, you, you know, I, I've got to figure out a way if, if, if I'm blessed to get this nomination and run across America and talk about tax reform, bank reform, budget reform, immigration reform, trade with China. I've been to China many times, and there's a lot we can do. I'd love to talk about it. But the first thing I'm going to have to do is raise the money from the public at $100 to repay Americans elect because they won't disclose where they get their money from. And I think it's a big mistake. Okay. So... Do you want to answer that? Yeah, yeah I, I think that's an important one to answer because obviously it, it's something that as I've gone across the country as a field director and spoken to a lot of supporters, you know, it's certainly feedback that I've heard a lot. And, and I think that it's, it's obviously a, a very understandable point that's made. Um, and a lot of it's, I think, made under the prism that we, we heard all of us speak a little bit tonight about in terms of the influence of money in politics. And I think sort of the inherent problem that we've all had is this, this quid pro quo, this idea that, you know, I'm going to give money to you, but in return... Once you're in the White House, I expect a phone call. I expect you know you to do my bidding, and I think that's one of the big things for us, for me, in terms of getting involved early on. Uh, you know, the decision was made from Americans elect early on that it would be a 501c4, uh, meaning that we, you know, there's voluntary disclosure. Um, and one of the things that I think is a big distinction between us and, and what makes us a little bit different from that kind of traditional paradigm of quid pro quo politics is that our contributors have no idea who the candidate's going to be, and, and more important, the candidates have no idea who the contributors are. Uh, so that, that quid pro quo in this instance doesn't exist. And so it's understandable that there's a lot of energy and passion behind the, the frustration with it because it has been a problem. But in this particular instance, I, there isn't that connection between, you know, I'm giving you this money, but in return I'm asking this of you because, frankly, there is no discussion between candidate and, and contributor, uh, and, and there is no knowledge of who it might be. In fact, it's probably more likely that it will end up being a candidate that a contributor doesn't support or like. Uh, and so, hi. This is a question for Kellen. Uh, I wonder what role Americans elect uh, hopes uh, that uh, instant runoff voting will play, uh, and if you're doing anything to support instant runoff voting. Sure. Uh, I mean, I think we've looked at it, and certainly being a, being a California native, I think we've seen it in, most recently in in, uh, in Alameda County in the city in the city of Oakland. Uh, I, I think that one of the things that sort of Americans like has sort of a lot of partners, which is just folks that are like minded organizations or folks that are looking to revamp the the entire way that we. Uh, we approach our, our electoral process and, and kind of that idea, that spirit that I started off my presentation with, which is that if we change the way we elect leaders and we can change the way they govern. And so, I mean, Americans elect is a very specific goal oriented thing as it relates to just how we nominate a presidential candidate. And obviously the mechanism with which we nominate our candidates on our, on our online platform is something that's only gonna be independent to us. I mean, it's, it's an important distinction that we're not advocating that we can have an online election in, in November. I mean, we're, we're an online caucus, actually, so this is not a secret ballot in that sense, uh, because I don't think the technology is there yet. But when it comes to other mechanisms, I think that it's something that, that me, me personally, I'm, I'm supportive of, of looking into those, because again, it goes to that underlying principle that if we change the way we elect our leaders, then perhaps we can change the way we govern them. But Americans elect as an organization is not really attempting to, to change that at this point in any time. Hi, this is really for Ian and for Rocky. I get frustrated when people say there isn't a third party because there's a third party which pretty much agrees with everything that Rocky said, and that's the Green Party. I mean, they've been around, I know, in Germany I know they're a lot stronger, but they've been around here for a long time. And um, I was kind of wondering why it was called the you know, third party, can a third party win? I realized this is actually was a president-elect kind of forum because I was wondering, where's the Green Party? I'm sure you've been asked, why didn't you just run into the Green Party? It seems like if we kind of... You, I think it was in your program today you talked about the left being all divided. Uh, there's a, a lot of agreement of your platform under the Green Party, and it doesn't seem like we need to invent a new party, but instead just have a whole push towards, you know, a candidate who isn't perfect on every issue, but basically that same general platform. So I guess it's both for Ian and for Rocky. Why not have the Green Party as part of the the big part of this discussion. 
Well, the Green Party have been around for a while, as you point out. They have been quite influential in Europe where they've been an important vote in Germany and they have a parliamentary system where small parties can, can carry disproportionate influence. We have, of course, a winner-take-all system here, so you're supposed to form your coalitions before the government, before the elections, not after. But I guess for not having a Green Party representative on the stage today may have more to do with the fact that the Green Party has been in the last, what, three or four presidential elections and hasn't, I don't think, in fact, their numbers may have gone down. They have. They haven't, re so it's not me that hasn't accepted the Green Party, it's the American people. No, I didn't think it was any point because, we, first of all, we can't have four people and I wanted to have people on who were bringing something new to the table. And we actually had some discussions with Jill Stein and other members of the Green Party uh, very early on before the, the Justice Party was formed and before I announced my candidacy. And uh, I laid out some of those same kinds of concerns, that, that their numbers are, are decreasing. Jill Stein gets a, a lower percentage of the vote every time she runs. And it seems to me that instead of running token candidates, we really need to build a party that is more broad-based, that's not just perceived as being a sliver on the left, but where we become a powerhouse in U.S. politics. And that, that is why we started the Justice Party. We intend to change uh, the face of United States politics and represent people across the political spectrum and give everybody a home that wants to clean up our system, that wants to get us out of this empire-building madness and wants to put the American people to work. Uh, and it's going to take more than just a marginal party to do that. I respect a lot of what they do. I, I respect what the Green Party stands for, uh, but I think we can do a, a whole lot better. And frankly, I would like to see in this election every one of us, Buddy Romer, the Green Party, the, the uh, uh, Libertarians, the Independents, the Justice reform. Party come together under a common banner and break this obscene duopoly that has brought us to this point in our nation's history. If, if, if we could get if we could get 15 percent in a national poll uh, through the summer, then I think we have a case to be made in the on the national debate stage. I've talked to the Reform Party. I'm a reformer all my life. I look at the system and 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 see it the way it could be, not the way it is. Uh, and I've, I've won many, I've lost a few, but I've always stuck by those guns, and I feel that same way about the Green Party. I got the Sierra Club Award as governor of Louisiana cleaning up the oil and gas. I didn't take their money. I didn't take the chemical money. There, there's a lot that we have in common here. And, and I didn't answer the question that Rocky answered about how do you build uh, momentum without big money and without national exposure. You do it by building coalitions. I'm a politician, I build coalitions. The Reform Party, the Independent Party, Party A, Party B, Party C, who have a common belief that the country can do better. And if we can put together 2% here and 3% there, 5%, and start building that, at some point we'll reach critical mass. And the other two candidates, who are decidedly ignoring us now, will have to turn in our direction. And when they do, we'll have a chance to stand up. Uh, thanks. Um, this is a question for, um, what was Kellen. your? Kellen. Ke Kellen. Yeah. Uh, Peter Ackerman, who created and heads up American Elect, got his start as a partner to the infamous Michael Mil Milken at Drexel Burnham and Lambert. And his biggest client there was Bain Capital, Mitt Romney's firm. So can you assure us that American, Americans elect is not trying to siphon off and split the independents who might vote for Obama in order to help Romney? Sure, yeah, I, actually I didn't know that, but sure, absolutely, you know, I, I've been involved with Americans Elect since April of 2010, and uh, one of the things that I, that's happened out of that capacity is I've gotten to meet a tremendous amount of people who've been involved in, in various capacities, from our advisory board to our volunteers, and one of the things that I think has been very unique is that all of them come from, from different backgrounds, but really want the same thing, which is they want to see a better process <laughs> that creates a, a, better, a better country and a better future. Um, and in terms of, of why the various individuals have, have 
thrown their, their support in, whether it's financial or their time, um, that's obviously, I, I suppose, up to them. Um, but with that said, I mean, I think that that when you take a look at uh, somebody like, like Peter Ackerman, who had a very kind of wide, diverse career, certainly one that, that did exist in banking and the financial sector, but also one that, that existed in academia in terms of, of getting involved in nonviolent movements and breaking down duopolies, especially in, in Eastern Europe and throughout the Middle East. Um, I, I mean, I think a lot of folks came to the realization that, that American Select was a new kind of organization to get involved in. Uh, and I think that one of the things that was exciting about it was that they didn't know what the, the end result would be. Um, except that we'd put forth a unity ticket that'd be on all 50 states. And I think everybody, you know, it was hard to, to know in 2010 who the candidates would be now that they've, it's been settled between, between Obama and Romney. And there's a lot of confidence that there's still a space for that unity ticket to be, to come in and really make a difference. Um, but one of the things that I've learned going into it is that nobody came into it with an idea or, a, or an alternative agenda, I guess, to, to really siphon any votes away. I mean, it was really more of an agenda of, of shining a spotlight on what I think is a broken system and what Americans elect thinks is a broken system and offering up a solution to solve it. So I, I can absolutely assure you that there is no, no ulterior motives there other than, than breaking up what I think is a, is a broken duopoly. I think they'd be stronger with full disclosure. I think it's true in every case. I know all the excuses. I think they'd be stronger with full disclosure, and I want them to be strong. If I'm running... As the presidential nominee, if I'm lucky enough to get that, and I'm a long way from there, or if Rocky gets it, I want the platform to be clean and strong. I have personally decided to repay every penny for my donations. If I get my $3 million at $100, that's $300 million. That's enough to beat President Obama and Romney put together. But I'll spend $30 million of it back to Americans elect, I won't owe them a dime, and I won't take a penny from them. And I will demand in House Bill 1, thereafter, full disclosure. I think most of us are familiar with that old phrase, burn me once, shame on you, burn me twice, shame on me. Um, you did better than George W. Bush. Well, <laughs> certainly a lot of Democrats who voted for Nader feel that way, and a lot of Republicans who voted for Perot feel that way. How do you assuage the fear of people who are aligned with a party that their vote, and it seems like in 2012 would be the Democrats, would be throwing away their vote and essentially guaranteeing defeat for their candidate or for the candidate that they would like to see most in the traditional two-party system? The spoiler factor. Had, had. I think that's a great question, and I think it, that it's the biggest obstacle we're facing uh, because of the fear uh, especially among Democrats or, or others that are by who they consider the greater of two evils. I frankly consider President Obama to be the more effective of the two evils. I, I approach it this way. And, and, what does and, that mean, Robbie? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what it means. There's, if, if George Bush were the president today, there is no way given the opposition that we would have seen from the Democratic Party and the rest of us that would have taken to the streets, no way would we have seen the signing of a bill that would allow the president to point to anybody, including United States citizens, and have them indefinitely detained up to the rest of their lives without trial, without charges, without legal assistance, and without the right of habeas corpus. But because it was President Obama, the Democrats fall in line and they say, well, we can't raise such a ruckus because he might be defeated by Mitt Romney. The same go holds true. President Bush never would have added a U.S. citizen to his list for assassinations. Again, completely at odds with the due process clause. Never could have happened with a Republican president. We're seeing the ratcheting up of an imperial presidency unlike anything this nation has ever seen. Our republic is being completely undermined, and where will we draw the line? So as to the spoiler issue, I urge you to think of it this way because it's what finally convinced me. I, I kept out of this for a long time because of those same concerns. Because I don't think we should do anything that will cause our nation harm. But if we let that fear of the lesser of two evils being defeated 
stop us from ever supporting real change, and I mean systemic change, getting rid of, of the, the, the corrupting influence of money that will never happen as long as the Democrats and Republicans are in office. Taking the measures to reverse this trend toward this imperial presidency and the undermining of our republic, if that's always going to stop us, we're never going to see change. We're only going to see a, a reaffirmation of the status quo, and it's going to continue getting worse. We're better than that as an American people. We can choose change. They did it with Abraham Lincoln. It was a third party, the Republican Party, the anti-slavery party. The people of this country decided that's what they wanted, and they voted for real systemic change. That's what this race is all about. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing. I think it's why your buddy Romer's doing what he's doing. And we can't continue on this fear-based path anymore. Otherwise, we're simply just changing around the Democratic and Republican players within this corrupt, perverse system. Let's finally say we're going to go with a new system. We're going to clean up our government, and we're going to see that our government finally stands up for the interests of the public rather than for their corporate sponsors. It's simple to me. Obama doesn't count. Bush didn't count. Romney won't count. They don't make any difference. They're owned by the special interest. You get it? The Wall Street banks own them. You get it? I mean, I'm a banker. I get regulated. Now, I'm not too big to fail. The too big to fail, fail banks don't get regulated. It's a whole different world. Look at health care. Look at bank reform. Look at what goes on in this country. There's no fear that you're going to defeat one and elect the other. What difference does it make? Every eight years, we flop back and forth. Bill Clinton, he did away with Glass-Steagall. It wasn't Bush. It was Bill Clinton, 1991. I mean, 1999. Bill Clinton did away the Commodities Futures Trading Regulation, the year 2000. That was Bill Clinton on the dole from the big money. And then Bush comes in and bails out the same crew. And then Obama comes in and keeps Geithner and keeps doing the bailout. Listen to me, America. Quit saying there's a difference between the Democrat and Republican. Only in their speeches, not in their actions. I've been in both parties. They're connected at the billfold. You've got no risk here. I've raised over a million dollars, and 40% of it comes from Democrats, and about 40% of it comes from Republicans, and about 20% from independents. You're going to take votes from both of them because they're both Weak, weak, weak. Washington is not just busted. It's bought. Remember that. They're true. But you're not going to change that overnight. That's going to take time. It always takes time. And it's a marginal. The, 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 the ruling of the Supreme Court on on um, Citizens United was 5-4. It could go the other way in a year or two, but I'm not going to wait on that. There are things we can do the first day. Who's running for president who has a campaign reform bill the first day? Nobody. Because they don't give a damn about it. They need the money. They're addicted to the money. You remember that. I've been in the Democrat caucus. I've been in the Republican caucus. You haven't. And there's no publicity there. It's closed doors. And you know what they talk about? Money. I de I'm the only congressman that didn't take his retirement. I'm the only governor that didn't take his retirement. I'm a free man. I want a president free to lead. And I don't care what party they belong to. I don't think we give such short shrift to the concern about the Supreme Court, though, because the nominees are going to be different. But let's not forget, Scalia, 98 to 0 in the United States Senate. He was confirmed. Yeah. Those were the Democrats joining with the Republicans. We wouldn't see Alito. We wouldn't see Roberts. We wouldn't see Clarence Thomas if the Democrats had stood up against their nominations. 
Uh, thanks very much for a, a great forum. Um, as an independent uh, viewer of the US political system from uh, another country, I see, the, I see the system as quite like a gridlocked uh, society where if you don't control the House, you don't control the Senate, nothing's ever going to get done. So I would just think a question to both candidates, like how would you go about if you, if you did get to the, into the office, uh, the president, how would you go about reforming like the whole system that is totally uh, jammed and how, how would you go about the gridlock system where no one actually ever gets anything done? Well, I've been a congressman. I've actually passed bills. The economic sanctions against South Africa, that was me. We got Nelson Mandela out of jail. It can be done. In the old days, the, the Democrats and Republicans used to join in the center, and that's where you build a nation, in the center. Now they're apart. The, the Democrats pull to the left, the Republicans pull to the right, and money does that. The first thing a president has to do is lead, and I would lead on campaign reform. Second, I would be willing to listen. It's what I do best at 68. I'm not near as smart as when I was 19 or 39. I've learned to listen. I will propose campaign reform and listen to Congress to make it better. But I will lead. I will tell Congress gently that we will pass none of their bills until they give me mine. It will be House Bill 1. I will use my veto pen to do that. Number three, I will give them all the credit when we do it. Now, this is rare. I'm not running for re-election. I'm running to build a nation. And my commitment to the American people is that when those from across the aisle stand up with courage and give me help, when I address the nation in a joint session of Congress, unlike President Reagan or President Obama, I won't be pointing to the audience. I'll be pointing to the floor and thank the Congresswoman from California and the congressman from North Dakota, and the congressperson from Texas for standing for a better America. I will lead, I will listen, and I will give credit to others. And we will slowly but surely go through the seven to ten reforms that we need to make this country great. And when we do, We'll have the strongest economic boom this country's had since World War II. As governor of Louisiana, we took the unemployment rate from 12.8 to 5.6 in four years. And you know what I did? No new programs. I balanced the budget. I reformed taxes. And I passed campaign reform. That's what you have to do. But just, just a little historical note here, buddy. Your hero, Teddy Roosevelt, when he got re-elected, he said, I'm not going to run again. And he, and he wished for the rest of the next, that whole four years that he could take those words back because yeah. he made himself a lame duck. Yeah. And if you say you're only going to run for one term, they'll wait you out. Well, uh, let me be honest. Uh, we'll see what happens. What I, what I was trying to say is that I won't act like I'm running for re-election. I will act. I'll put the nation first, not my party or my future. I watched this president, who has dashed every hope I had in terms of leadership, announce for re-election at the tail end of his second year of a four-year term, announcing that he was going to raise a billion dollars to do it. I think that's a mistake. I could run again. Uh, I'm willing but I'm not eaten up by it. I would rather have four years clean and build the basis of a recovery and fade away and make me perfectly happy. And I think, I think one of the greatest obstacles to getting the people's work done is the filibuster. It's being absolutely abused. We need 60% now to pass any significant legislation in this country. It's absolutely anti-democratic. The filibuster was a rule that was in place so that people could get back to Washington to vote. And the way that it has been abused is, I think, a real betrayal to the people of this country. Secondly, we to, to provide real leadership to get the people's business done, 
You need to reach out to the people of this country. That's how Franklin Delano Roosevelt got the Social Security Act through. He didn't just throw it up there and then sit back and let Congress battle it back and forth the way President Obama did with his proposal for health care reform. He went out and got the American people behind it, and he made it impossible for Congress to say no. And he made the case for it. The people of this country understood it's the fair and the right thing to do to provide an economic safety net for people in advanced age in this country. Now, why don't we see that kind of leadership in this country when it comes to basic health care coverage for every citizen and reducing the costs and getting better medical outcomes than what we have with our perverse system? We know what it is. It's, we don't have anybody going out and making the case. You actually, you don't need to because the majority of people in this country want to see single-payer Medicare for all. And the reason we don't have it is because of the money flowing in from the for-profit insurance companies and the pharmaceutical industries. And we need to expose it, and we need to make that case to the American people and make anybody in Congress ashamed to take that money and ashamed for getting in the way, resulting in the deaths of over 40,000 people a year in this country because they don't have health care. Do you know that we, other than Latvia, we have the highest rate of new baby deaths in the developed world. We have one of the highest rates of maternal mortality, women dying during childbirth in the industrialized world. And it's because of the lack of health care. It's the reliance upon for-profit insurance companies that is unknown anywhere else in the industrialized world. So we need the kind of leadership that's going to be independent of that money, that, that is looking to the interests of the American people, and that will finally represent the public interest and be able to turn its back on the corrupting influence of all of this money and these lobbying blitzes that are so effective that, they, that three telecommunication companies can throw $12 million in a three-month lobbying blitz and even get Barack Obama to support, after he promised to join a filibuster against it, to support retroactive immunity for felonious conduct by these telecommunication companies in aiding and illegal surveillance of American citizens? Thank you to everybody and for your questions. And, and certainly right now we're at a, at a stage with, uh, where we need to, to see as much support we can for, for both of these gentlemen and numerous other candidates. So the best way to do that is to log on to americanslect.org, sign up to be a delegate, and you can support as many candidates as you'd like. Uh, the, certainly these two gentlemen on stage with me as well. So thank you. And you are going to talk to your bosses and tell them to clean, clean up the system. Soon as I'm in, as soon as I'm out of here, absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you. Coming to town, uh, Rocky and Buddy, it's, I really enjoyed the, this evening. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. Remember, it's kind of really healthy. Thanks. Remember, it doesn't take a long speech. Washington is bought. The first act is campaign reform. Everything else is second.